Uh, hey everyone, thanks for joining our Getting Started with Portainer webinar. Uh, today we're going to go over the 12 step best practices checklist for deploying Portainer into a production environment. Uh, this information comes right from our welcome and setup guide that we send out with uh, new licenses. And it gives a pretty comprehensive overview of the different topics that you should care about when you're putting Portainer into production. So give me just a moment to share my screen here. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, the first step is to prepare the environment where, where Portainer will run. And that is like legit the server it's going to run on. So either like a Linux machine with Docker or maybe a Docker Swarm cluster or Kubernetes cluster. Um, that's what you're preparing first. Um, if you're, if what you're using has off node persistent storage, like a block storage device or NFS modes, this would be the time to get that set up. And then if you're in a cluster environment, this would be the time to make sure that like that storage is available to all the nodes in the cluster. Um, and specific to Docker swarm clusters, this is the ideal time to make sure that your um, overlay network is functioning properly. Um, overlay network problems can cause like not just erratic behavior in the swarm, but just erratic behavior within Portainer and what information it can get from the worker nodes. So um, one way to test that would be to deploy like a global Nginx service and then counsel into the Nginx container at each node and curl to the Nginx container at the other nodes and just make sure that overlay network is functioning properly. Um, also, right now is where you want to make sure that you do have root access to your Docker host um, well, and or cluster admin role access against a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the next step is to deploy Portainer using the, the instructions that match your environment because Portainer can be installed in so many environments. Um, it's best to hit either install.portainer.io or docs.portainer.io and just find your environment and go through the instructions there. Um, for today, we're just deploying on a Docker standalone. So I took the Docker run command right from our documentation site to start that up. Um, after that's deployed, when you're logging in for the first time, you're prompted to set the admin username and password. Um, of particular interest is the admin user. We suggest changing it to something other than admin, something non-standard or a uh, random string or just anything other than admin. And then after you set those, you'll immediately be prompted for your Portainer business license. So actually, let me show you what that looks like here. If I go to the newly deployed Portainer EE that we just uh, started up here, um, we do have self-signed certificates, which we will address in a few moments, but that's why we have the potential security risk that we can blow right past and get to our Portainer login. And because this is our first login, we can set our admin username to something not standard here. And then we'll give it a good password. And then when we create the user, that is when we're prompted to put in our Portainer license. So let me grab that. And then we are on the Portainer homepage. And actually, just as like a, a bonus step, a 13th step for you today, um, and hopefully to make it easier for everyone to see this, if you click on my account in the top right-hand corner, you come down and change your theme. So we'll switch over to the light theme just to make uh, the webinar easier for everyone to see. The next step is to add environment. So Portainer is not only going to manage or isn't only capable of managing the host that it's on, but you can add all your other environments. You can add thousands of environments, either Docker environments, Kubernetes environments, um, edge environments. And I'll show you where to do that here. If you click on environments over on the left, you can click on add environment and you can see the different options. We have an, an agent that would run on hosts in the same local network. <clears throat> it's deployed especially for uh, like a swarm cluster. Um, we have edge agent for when you need a remote agent. 
Um, some people choose to expose their Docker API right over a TCP port. And that's right here is where you can add just a connection to another Docker API TCP port. Um, local Kubernetes cluster. If you're going to uh, manage a remote Kubernetes cluster, you're probably going to deploy an edge agent there. Um, and then we also support Microsoft Azure um, ACI containers. So next, uh, we'll configure Portainer to use trusted SSL certs. So with our self-signed certificates, we get the encryption, but we don't get the authentication that like, yeah, this is the host that you're looking for. So let's just set those up real quick here. Um, that is in settings over on the left. And then if you scroll down and find SSL certificate, I have mine here. I have my certificate file. And I have my private key file. And this is for a specific registered host name at a specific domain. When I add these and I hit apply changes, I'm going to be redirected, but to the same host name as you can see at the top, localhost. So I'm going to hit apply changes. And because localhost does not match the host name that the SSL certificate was issued for, that's why we still see the potential security risk. So if I go to this same Portainer deployment, but using the name, the DNS name that the SSL certificate is tied to, you can see I land at the Portainer login screen and I have a valid certificate now. So I'm going to go ahead and log back into Portainer with our not standard admin username. So after SSL certificates, uh, pretty good idea now that we have like kind of the base structure set up to go ahead and configure Portainer backups. Um, you can just pull a backup right down to whatever client machine you're using your browser to access Portainer. Um, but we suggest pointing it to we support um, pushing your backups to an Amazon S3 bucket. And I'll show you where that's at right now. If you click on settings here, and scroll to the bottom on backups. Um, with this set to download backup file, you can just click download backup and your browser is going to download it right to your machine. Um, but if we switch over to store in S3, and I have an S3 bucket created, so let me go ahead and throw the credentials in here for that. And this was created over on US East 2. And it was named Portainer 101 Backups. I'm going to save this first. And then just by clicking on Export Backup, that backup is gathered up and sent to S3. You can also schedule your backups. So if you want to schedule them automatically, um, you'll probably be familiar with this as classic cron syntax. So that would be every night at 2 AM. But you can schedule it for whenever you want to. Um, and those will just continuously push to be pushed to Amazon S3. So moving on, um, while you're preparing to go into production and you're going to use external authentication, um, this is the time to set up our team structure within Portainer. That way you can give access rights to different teams, like an environment, a team has access to an environment, a different team has different access rights to that same environment there. So if we look over in users, and teams. Um, and actually, let me show you this on a Portainer instance that has teams created in it already. If we go over here and we click on users and we click on teams, you'll see that we have several teams already added in here. You can add new teams very easily. You just add them in here, create team, and it lands in there. So the reason these are important is because these will be the teams that get mapped to your user groups uh, when you're leaning on LDAP or Microsoft AD or OAuth. So that's that's why that's important for the RBOC there. So after adding teams, um, it would be time to look at like getting ready to, to set up the external authentication. Um, and we have quite a few options for external authentication. Um, if we scroll down to settings and under there, there is an authentication uh, page here. And right now we are set to internal authentication. That's where our admin user is. Um, we support tying into LDAP authentication, open LDAP. We support Microsoft Active Directory. Um, and then OAuth, we have a few built in, Microsoft, Google, and GitHub built in. 
but you can use any OAuth providers. Like if you're using Okta or somebody like that, you can fill in their specific settings and then that'll get all of your authentication happening externally. And then when you set up automatic user provisioning, what that will do is make it so that you don't have to pre-configure a bunch of Portainer accounts. You can set it up so that once I successfully authenticate through GitHub, that account is created in Portainer on the back end for me. Uh, moving on to registries, uh, container registries, because Portainer allows you to manage um, RBOC access to registries and also allows you to view registries and push and pull images to them. Um, it's very aware of registries. And actually, I'll show you where those are set up here. Over on the left, if you click on registries, on this host, we have some container registries already set up. And I'll, I'll show you those, but first let me show you how to add a registry. So you'll see a number of popular container registries are ported here as well as a custom. So you can like, I have at times run a container image, just run the registry to a container image um, on a port and then pointed this custom setting to that. Um, the workflow wise, it's actually pretty cool. Let me show you the, the GitLab workflow. If I were to be adding a container registry um, that was housed at GitLab, I can come in here and this is just regular public GitLab service. I'll put in my GitLab username and my GitLab personal access token. And then what it's gonna do is talk to GitLab's API and get my well, repositories that are up at GitLab. And then I can choose which ones I want to add. And I have already added these, so I won't re-add them, but I will show you what they look like once they're added here. Um, one of those is right here. And when we look at the details of it, you'll see it's uh, destined for registry.gitlab.com. We have uh, the location of it, our username, and then the repository name, and then the authentication required for that. So as long as this registry supports um, API v2, we are able to browse it, which means you can click on browse over here and you can see the container images that are located in here and get some more information and again, push and pull to and from those images. So that is making Portainer aware of any registries that you'll be using, whether they're public or, or your own. Um, the next step kind of pulls together everything that we've been working on, or at least some of the major parts of what we've been working on. Uh, we've got our user set up um, and we've discussed connecting that to an external user database, which will then get mapped to the teams that we've created. We also have different environments added, um, Docker APIs, Kubernetes hosts. And now what we can do is we can manage access to those environments because we have all of this set up. So, if I click on environments here, these are just the environments that this Portainer instance happens to be managing. I can click on manage access. And this is where I can say, hey, my external users only get read-only access. So this is where I can set up that role-based authentication per environment. So uh, for instance, if I'm in a group of users that does not have any access to this environment, when that user logs in and I'm on this homepage looking at environments, that environment doesn't even show up. So you can, you can get pretty granular um, with how you're doing the RBAC rules there. Um, if finally, we have settings for the host itself. So you've got Docker, you've got Kubernetes on a host. There are some kind of system-wide, host-wide settings um, that are available that I would like to show you on a Docker host. Um, some of the settings that are available um, this is for Edge up here, which we'll talk about. Um, everything has available to it an enable change window, um, which is pretty cool, uh, fairly unique uh, in this space. And what this does is it sets a time frame in which if any changes happen with like our automated GitOps or anything that would restart services, if changes happen outside of this window, um, they won't happen. So you don't have to worry about any changes to any of your stacks or anything automated happening outside of a specific window there. 
Uh, we also have settings for whether or not regular users can do bind mounts, um, which is good to restrict if you care about it. Regular users could bind mount your host's entire root file system and have access to it. Um, some of your privileged mode and some of the settings that you would normally have, like on a Docker run, are controlled here. And because Docker hosts are managed differently than Kubernetes hosts, you'll see it's a completely different setup if we look at a Kubernetes host and manage it. And we look at those same settings, those same host security settings. We'll just go ahead and let this create its tunnel. And then if we go to the same place we were on that Docker host, but on this Kubernetes host and look at setup, we have Kubernetes specific, like node-wide settings here. Um, we still have our change window, but we can do things like restrict access to the default namespace, which is a very good idea. Uh, whether or not users can touch the API or get access to uh, some of the storage stuff there. So, and that actually takes care of like each host. So you would want to come through and check each one of these and make sure your host settings are, are how, how you want it there. And when you do have an edge client, if you're looking at your host settings for an edge client, like that's what's loading right here. Um, the one thing that uh, was not available to a regular not edge agent uh, setup was this enable host management and volume management, uh, which is pretty cool. And I just want to show you really quick what it allows you to do is on an edge agent running off wherever it's running in the world. Um, you can't actually get as far into that host as looking at its uh, whole file system if you need to um, if you need to remotely manage that there. So. That is our uh, 12 steps, uh, things that you should care about, uh, at least uh, topics of concern when you're putting a uh, portainer into uh, production. Uh, well, um, thank you very much for joining um, and we will uh, do this again next week. Thanks a lot. <laughs>